Paolo, okay, so we'll start now. Uh, uh, Ça a marché. Oui, c'est bon. C'est bon. OK. OK. <laughs> Technique, hein? Uh, so, it's a second part of this afternoon, still about energy. Uh, I am really happy to to receive to to host uh, Yves Marignac. Yves Marignac is a is a member a permanent member of the Negawatt Association. Mm -hmm. He will talk about Negawatt uh, Association, but I really want to stress that this association has been really key in France, really key in France, and probably in Europe and beyond, because I mean they gathered a very few experts on energy coming from different. Uh, uh, companies, small firms, uh, officials, uh, trying to build a scenario to decarbonize the economy uh, by 2050, uh, uh, keeping the, the track of, of what we, we, sh we shall do without nuclear uh, energy. So it, it was really something very complicated. They did a, a, an incredible job. And it became a, a scenario uh, of reference, really, uh, for for all people discussing about energy in France, even at state level. It became a key scenario, uh, and at European level too, and and, and even beyond. Uh, and we 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 talked a little bit about systemic approaches, and he will probably give you some insight about the yeah. <laughs> systemic approach they had of this transition. So, really, it's it's uh, I'm I'm. Yeah, I'm a fan of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I don't need that. You, you, yeah. Uh, this mic should be okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Happy New Year to start with. And uh, thank you for the uh, invitation, David. I'm really pleased to uh, present you this uh, work done by Negawatt, the Negawatt scenario uh, for uh, energy transition. And I will talk a lot about our scenario for France. And uh, in the very last part of my presentation, I will tell you a bit more about the work we've started a few years ago on uh, a European uh, level scenario. Um, <clears throat> maybe I should simply start with uh, uh, just uh, telling you uh, a little more about Negawatt uh, and what it is. So it's uh, as David said, it's a, a, a group of experts, a French think tank on uh, energy, which uh, was created more than 20 years ago. Uh, it's a nonprofit independent group of experts who uh, uh, contribute uh, on a, mostly on a voluntary basis and uh, uh, participate uh, individually. We have no uh, organization as members. Um, and uh, as you said, I mean, most of us are uh, field practitioners of, you know, developing uh, photovoltaic projects, of uh, retrofitting buildings, uh, working on uh, mobility and collecting in, uh, in uh, uh, local communities and so on, which uh, is uh, very important for, uh, you know, integrating all this experience in the uh, prospective work we are doing. Uh, the work we are doing is mostly uh, done by a, a group of roughly 25, 30 so-called companions uh, and uh, a, a growing number of, uh, of uh, people uh, of, uh, in, in, the, in the staff. We started with one uh, person in the staff in 2011. We have now more than 15. Uh, and the work Negawatt is doing is mostly uh, to produce energy scenarios, energy transition scenarios uh, the last one, which I will talk about, was published in October 21. Uh, and this work on scenario is a basis to 
talk about uh, policies and measures that we think are required to set uh, a pathway for a more sustainable system. Um, <clears throat> I will uh, actually start with trying to set this issue of sustainability and uh, the systemic approach that we think is needed um, to start with. The uh, starting by you know stating that really and that is core to our work uh, we think we, we see energy not only as resources that you can see on the left of this uh, of this uh, slides uh, resources energy resources that we find in our environment or as services that we draw from consuming energy making cars uh, engines uh, heating systems appliances working we really see energy as a system, a complex set of transformations between those resources and these services through energy carriers like electricity, like fuels and so on. And we think that this energy system is framing society. Uh, one way to uh, get convinced about it is to think how much the uh, like constricted choice through time of organizing all our mobility around the uh, individual property of cars is actually framing our lifestyles, the uh, urban urban planning, uh, our economy, our industry, uh, households, budgets, and so on. So <clears throat> we uh, have to deal with the system and the uh, second systemic dimension of the uh, issue, of course, is that this system is not sustainable and it's not sustainable in many ways. There's of course climate change at the core of uh, current uh, concerns, but uh, we must also uh, care for technological risks like uh, uh, oil pollutions, like uh, nuclear specific nuclear risk. We must talk about pollutions. We must talk about uh, depletion of resources uh, oil depletion, for instance, we must talk about issues of access to energy, energy poverty on a worldwide scale as uh, in uh, developed countries like ours. I mean, we have like 20, uh, 12 million people uh, in energy poverty in a, in a country like France. We must also talk about all the geopolitical tensions that this uh, unequal access to resources is creating. and. Uh, all these issues have to be dealt with, and none of this issue is, is completely specific to energy, which is another uh, complexity or systemic dimension. I mean, climate change also comes from uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, agriculture. Uh, <clears throat> depletion of resources is also uh, a depletion of metallic resources, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have to uh, deal with the uh, a systemic issue. Um, and talking about this uh, systemic issues and, and, and sustainability, I mean, the context we see, uh, we saw when we uh, produced our latest scenario is that, I mean, it's worryingly, uh, uh, it's increasingly worrying, of course. Uh, we uh, refer here to uh, a quote by uh, a very famous quote by uh, former French president uh, Jacques Chirac, who said, "Our house is burning, and we we are like turning off uh, our uh, eyes away." Um, so yes, our house is burning, and it it it, it actually burns uh, very concretely, as we saw uh, last summer in, uh, in 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 some places. We have this climate urgency. We have increasing inequalities, massive loss of bio of biodiversity, uh, and uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, threats, a lot of uh, risks, a lot of impacts. But more than ever, it's not only that we are like turning our uh, eyes away. We are we are just uh, facing, without doing anything, uh, extinguishers piling up. In, in the sense that there's a growing number of reports, there's a growing numbers of scenarios, of studies, which tell us what we should do, uh, not only to tackle uh, climate change, but to tackle also uh, uh, all uh, 
um, uh, all these sustain, uh, sustainability issues. We have plans, we have ecological transition plans. We know that they are feasible, we know that they uh, are rational, we know that they could be considered an economic opportunity compared to the costs of inaction. Still, we are facing uh, at best slow progress and in many cases inaction. So we really need to uh, step up and to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, work on uh, uh, sustainability roadmaps and in, 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 in a context of increasing urgency. This is what uh, the Negawatt scenario is about. Uh, it's about, uh, through a complete scenario, first creating uh, a kind of shared vision that is positive enough to get uh, the whole society, to get all players, all stakeholders uh, moving in the same direction. Um, but that's not enough. We need a concrete pathway. And that's what uh, prospective analysis is about. I mean, you, you can create very nice visions of 2050 or any, uh, any, any time, but if you don't know how to get from where we are, from our real concrete situation to that vision, uh, you uh, <clears throat> can't really um, think of policies and measures, and you can't really think of means to get through this pathway to this shared vision. So uh, in, our, in our view, a scenario is really uh, a, a political tool to work on all of these levels. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, um, we are uh, uh, developing this based on a, a, a comprehensive technical analysis, which is practical and operational in the sense that we, we, we have this field experience. It's collective and that, that is also very important because when you talk about systemic issues, I mean, none of us can get a grasp on all of the uh, uh, technicalities we need to uh, take into account and uh, uh, not only uh, uh, not only in, in, in technical fields but also in, in economic fields, social issues and so on. So that is uh, what we try to uh, get together and, uh, and grasp and we do this, as I said, uh, in a political purpose which is to uh, propose for political debate, for democratic debate, uh, uh, a transition project uh, where, and, and to develop understanding that we are really increasingly on a crest line to follow, uh, to uh, implement such a transition project and uh, avoid uh, failure, avoid, avoid uh, the cost of inaction and so on. So, uh, and that has been uh, a kind of process throughout our uh, successive, successive scenarios, uh, we uh, more than ever uh, emphasize that uh, it's not only a technical scenario, that it is uh, really a work to serve uh, the ambition of a more peaceful or more sustainable uh, 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 and, and fair society. Um, so we, and, and we think this is very important when developing expertise to be clear about the values that drive our work, our collective work. So we, uh, we uh, explicitly refer to a set of values, which are uh, like democracy, peace, social justice, and so on. So positive, uh, positive values, collective values. And uh, we consider that uh, the, the purpose of the scenario is to put these values into action uh, to respond to ecological challenges, of course, uh, to, uh, to uh, set a pathway for economic and social progress, improvement of life conditions, and better and fairer governance. And uh, I might come back to that, but we think that the governance issue is not only a goal uh, of sustainability, but it's also a, uh, uh, um, a completely uh, necessary and crucial mean to get there and to develop sustainability. And <clears throat> maybe one, uh, one innovation in our scenario is to, uh, um, uh, to use, to, to, to develop 
uh, uh, pathway to develop a vision, a scenario that fits these objectives to use the uh, integrated matrix of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 UN Development Goals, because we think that this integrated matrix is a good way to think upfront of all the issues we want to uh, tackle uh, in our scenario. So the, the issues we try to embed in our modeling or in our building of assumptions. Uh, and also a good, a very good uh, matrix, a very good set of uh, criteria to assess once we are done to assess the results of uh, our scenario. And I, I will, of course, come back to that. Um, I hope you're familiar with this uh, uh, SDG uh, integrated matrix, but I mean, the, the, the main point is really that it covers not only uh, ecological issues, environmental issues like biodiversity or climate, but also social ones, societal ones, economic ones, and even uh, some issues of uh, global partnerships and peace which we also uh, think uh, are important. Um, and um, I mean, uh, I just put this uh, in big to emphasize this uh, quote from the uh, UN decision to adopt these uh, SDGs back in 2015, a few months before uh, the uh, uh, COP21 Paris Agreement on Climate Change. In the words of the uh, United Nations, this should be seen as an integrated and indivisible matrix, which means that when we focus on one of the uh, sustainable development goals, we should never lose sight of the other ones. And that is very important when uh, you want to develop decarbonization uh, scenarios. And this is uh, an illustration of why it's important Important and why all mitigation options are not equal in uh, uh, the uh, context of global unsustain unsustainability. Uh, I won't get into the details of this, but this is uh, a kind of summary of a work done by uh, IPCC in 2018 in uh, its uh, special report on 1.5 degrees uh, trajectories. Uh, they emphasized the importance of taking into account the sustainability impact of mitigation uh, strategies. And uh, what they did is a scientific review of, uh, of uh, existing literature uh, about what it says on the impact of each of the main uh, emission reduction options. And they uh, included 23 of them its impact on all of the sustainable uh, development goals. So obviously there's in, in some cases, scientific literature does say nothing, uh, either because there's no relationship or because it hasn't been studied. But in many cases, there is uh, something to be found in scientific literature about these impacts. And uh, this is just uh, uh, the uh, uh, global score of all these options on uh, sustainability as, uh, as uh, assessed by uh, IPCC. Uh, the uh, higher the, the score, the, bet, the better the impact on sustainable development goals. So what you can see here is uh, mostly two things. First, uh, if, you, if you look at the center values, uh, there's a huge difference in the expected impacts of different mitigation options on uh, the uh, sustainable development goals. And the uh, bars around the central values tell us that this impact should be, uh, is likely to be dependent on the condition of implementations. And for some of the options, this dependency is uh, higher than uh, for others. Um, so for instance, you can see that uh, most of the uh, demand related options uh, that appear on the right uh, have positive impact on uh, sustainable development goals with no real uh, uh, no real critical issue of this impact uh, being negative in some uh, in some cases 
you can see, and I think we'll come back to that, that uh, there's a big difference between nuclear power and electric renewables when it comes to their sustainability impact. And in fact, nuclear power is the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the option with the uh, lowest score of these 23 options uh, uh, as assessed by uh, IPCC. And you can see that some options like soil carbon sequestration or uh, reduced deforestation and so on, which deal with uh, with the um, uh, uh, natural cycle of carbon are among the most dependent on the conditions of, uh, of implementation. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, was to uh, set the context of why it's important, even when you focus on decarbonization pathway to get uh, to, to, to grasp this uh, integrated vision and develop uh, a systemic approach which is what Negawatt has been trying to do through a systematic change of perspective on the way we look at energy. Uh, <clears throat> I will just um, make it more concrete through the example of one energy chain, which by energy chain, I mean a technical way, a technical pathway between an energy resource, in that case, oil and an energy use, in that case, lighting, um, which starts with the choice of this primary energy resource, oil in that case, which needs to be uh, prepared, refined to be used, uh, which uh, 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 incurs a first uh, step of losses, and if you want to use oil to get light, um, you need to go through electricity. So you need a transformation through a thermal power plant with, again, a lot of losses. You need to deliver this uh, carrier uh, electricity, uh, which uh, is called final energy in comparison to the primary energy of oil. You need to deliver it to end users through a grid with again some losses and then you get to what happens on the end user side and in most cases this is not very much studied because this falls beyond what national statistics could see which ends with the final energy delivered to consumers that is billed so you can uh, you can account for it what happens on the end user side is first that it needs to convert this final energy into a useful form. You don't actually consume electricity. I mean, you, electricity does serve no uh, real uh, purpose. I mean, you need to transform it into something useful. In that case, light, which emphasizes the importance of the uh, conversion because uh, traditional light bulb like this one uh, actually transform about 5% only of the electricity into light. 95% is lost as heat. So uh, obviously if you change it for more efficient light bulbs and uh, you can have five to four times more efficient light bulbs with uh, um, the, uh, I don't, I'm not sure about the English, fluo compact ones. Uh, but you can even get to uh, more than 10 times more efficient lights with LED. Um, so the importance of this conversion is uh, a first, uh, uh, first uh, significant step to uh, have in mind, but this is still not the end of the story. I mean, you, to use light, you need to put light bulbs into lighting systems. Um, in this example, uh, you have a lighting system, which is, from an aesthetic point of view, uh, perfect, fine, but from an energetic one, absolutely stupid. It sends most of the light created by the uh, light bulbs um, up when, it, when what's needed is light down. Um, so the uh, design and also the dimensioning, how many how many lights you have, uh, what intensity and so on, is also uh, very important. And finally, the conditions of use. 
are uh, of uh, re are, are also re also really matter. Uh, this in this example you have uh, an urban light which is well designed. We, it, it sends lights down. Uh, it's equipped with uh, uh, efficient an efficient light bulb. Still, it uses electricity for no energy service because this artificial light provides absolutely nothing more in a context of uh, the uh, ambient uh, natural light. So this, I mean, when, when you want to think about the energy system, you need to think of energy chains all along. And one step further, what we say, what we've been saying for uh, 20 years with Megawatt is that, I mean, the actual, I mean, the, the, the purpose of the energy system is not to burn primary energy. It's not to burn resources. The real purpose of that system, of course, is to deliver energy services. So we should think of the energy system starting with energy services and not starting with energy resources. And that's what we've been doing. And when you start uh, thinking about energy system, energy services, sorry, then the first thing which comes to uh, your mind is the conditions of use, the design, the dimensioning, which is what we call sufficiency in the sense of being more clever in the way we design and set energy services. And this comes as a first step before we deal with efficiency, which uh, means technically increasing the, the, the uh, performance along the chain, reducing energy losses uh, through uh, better appliances, better conversion, better uh, transformation, and so on. And this, in turn, allows for uh, aiming for substitution. And that is something because, uh, I mean, you, you, you might be conscious or not that uh, the whole history of humanity so far has been much more about adding new resources to existing ones than substituting. Uh, when, uh, I mean, we, we haven't given up on using uh, wood, for instance, burning wood for in heating systems when we got access to, uh, to uh, coal. We haven't given up coal when we got access to oil. We're piling up. And now it's the time because of planetary boundaries uh, to stop piling up and start substituting. And the key to, to get to substituting to, I mean, when we develop new resources, which we find, uh, which we consider more sustainable than previous one, I mean, if we want to get to sustainability, we don't need to add those sustainable resources to existing ones. We need those sustainable resources to replace existing less sustainable ones. In that case, uh, uh, priorita prioritarily uh, fossil fuels. So sufficiency and efficiency as a way to, to uh, contract, to uh, control the overall uh, amount of resources that we need is key to shift from adding to substituting. And that is really what uh, all uh, the work by Negawatt has been about uh, for 20 years. And uh, we, we know, say, uh, I mean, we, we, we've been developing this uh, uh, representation of this uh, like triptych uh, approach of this, uh, of this logic, but uh, really, the, uh, this systematic approach to uh, sustainability of the energy system is about those three levels of kind of cleverness, cleverness about uses, which we call sufficiency, cleverness about technical performances, efficiency, and cleverness about the choice of resources. And then there's a discussion about what we call sustainable uh, in, uh, I mean, <clears throat> Many players uh, focus so much on climate issues that they they they, they set the, uh, the, the 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 boundary the difference between sustainable and not sustainable resources only uh, through the uh, 
carbon content criteria. In that case, you have fossil fuels on one hand and renewables and nuclear power on the other hand. Our approach is, about, uh, is much more about global sustainability. And therefore, we set the difference between flow-based resources, therefore renewables, and stock-based resources, including fossil fuels and nuclear power, because we think that stock-based resources are intrinsically less sustainable in the long term than flow-based ones. But again, this might be an important discussion, especially in the case of France, where nuclear power is so important. But I mean, the, the importance of that discussion should never uh, got us, get us away from the uh, primary concern, which is that if you don't implement sufficiency and efficiency enough, then it's pointless to discuss about substituting. So it's pointless about to discuss about the more sustainable uh, supply options you, you want. Um, so all the work by uh, Negawatt is uh, about um, uh, like developing this uh, systemic and systematic approach uh, into a scenario for France. And I just need here to uh, remind everyone uh, about the uh, energy situation of France regarding this uh, sustainable uh, uh, criteria. Uh, <clears throat> I won't get into all details of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, graph, but uh, I mean, I mostly want to uh, remind you that uh, like almost 90% of uh, French primary energy supply comes from stock-based resources. Um, so the, uh, the share of renewable energy is, uh, is very low. The share of nuclear power is very big when you uh, account for it in primary energy, but because two thirds of the uh, energy generated by nuclear reactors is lost as heat uh, in the environment, uh, the share of nuclear power is actually lower when it comes to final energy. Nuclear power delivers about 70, 75% of French electricity and electricity uh, only amounts to one fourth of uh, final energy consumption. Um, so when you look at things from a final energy uh, perspective, like two thirds of French final energy consumption uh, still depend on imported fossil fuels which uh, shows that we are far from uh, uh, the uh, champion that the French government uh, sometimes uh, portrayed when it comes to uh, uh, climate change uh, issues. Uh, you can see on the right that the, uh, the, the uh, use of energy uh, is, um, I mean, energy services are dominated by heat services. Uh, like heating of buildings and, uh, and so on, and some uh, industrial processes. Um, then comes in uh, yellow uh, transport and mobility services. And uh, in blue, um, what we call specific electricity, which means all the uh, electricity used to run appliances, electricity used uh, in, uh, for energy services that could not be delivered in the same way by uh, other uh, other uh, um, uh, other uh, energy carriers. <laughs> um, maybe uh, a few words are useful about the uh, overall uh, um, boundaries of the of, of the scenario, starting with the uh, physical boundaries, meaning what we try to. Uh, represent through our modeling work. Um, and here, uh, two things uh, are important to emphasize. First, that we, we have always used uh, physical modeling, which means we don't, uh, we don't start modeling with uh, euros. Uh, and uh, actually, we don't use economic signals in our modeling at all. We develop 
uh, a trajectory that is uh, that we think is relevant to meet physical boundaries, physical sustainability boundaries, and then we question the kind of economics that can make it possible. So we don't. It's not that we do not care about economics, of course. It's just that we think that witnessing every day that economic signals don't put us on the right kind of pathway, that starting modeling based on economic signals is the best way not to get to a consistent and, uh, and, uh, and relevant uh, trajectory. So physical modeling, and then we uh, combine three models. Uh, historically, the first one we developed is the one what, which we call Negawatt, which uh, covers energy, uh, all energy uses and production imports and exports on the French level and greenhouse gas emissions uh, account. Um, since I think 2011, we combine this modeling with one called AFTER, developed by another uh, NGO called Solagro, which is really about the same kind of systemic and systematic and uh, services-based approach applied to agriculture, forest, land use, uh, fooding uh, systems. Um, and we developed and uh, used for, for our last scenario, a Negamat modeling, which is a comprehensive uh, representation of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, use, the need for raw materials, the raw materials footprint of French economy, and I mean coupling all these uh, all these models uh, provide us with a kind of I mean it's never as comprehensive as we would want. I mean we we don't cover water consumption issues, for instance, but it's uh, up to date. I think the most comprehensive. Uh, covering of uh, the uh, uh, French uh, economy footprint used in models and scenarios for France. The, uh, I mean, the scenario applies to uh, metropolitan France. Um, I mean, we, we, we need to choose uh, a, a level. Um, so that our detailed modeling applies to this um geographical uh, boundaries but uh we increasingly uh, take care of what happens on the european or uh, international level uh especially when it comes to uh, sharing of uh, of burden or sharing of resources we also uh, very much take care of what happens in territories and uh, you can see that the uh, s the plural is emphasized because Within the French territory, there are different territories with different uh, issues, with different potentials, different needs. And uh, we uh, want to develop a scenario that creates opportunities, that creates resilience uh, for uh, and, and, and economic dynamics for uh, all the uh, territories. Finally, when it comes to the time frame, we, uh, <clears throat> I mean, um, uh, it, it, it's been a, a long discussion when we started this uh, last latest scenario uh, to uh, stick to, to 2050 as the uh, final deadline or postpone it because, I mean, it, it's the same as when we started doing scenarios. So it means we represent a change that is even more challenging than 10 or 20 years ago. And we represent it in less time. Uh, the reason why we stick to 2050 is that this is the deadline to meet, uh, especially uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, so we, I mean, we, we can't escape it. We can't get comfort is in, in postponing. Nevertheless, we uh, increasingly uh, try to think of what happens next, because 20 years ago, when we represented change, like you know, from 20, 2005 to uh, 2050. I mean, that gave time for a complete change of the system. And we uh, used to have curves like, you know, which, which got flat 
by the, by the end. And we said, okay, we start with a system, we change it, and we get to another stable system. Uh, it's increasingly difficult to see it that way. We know that some challenges remain beyond 2050. So we uh, think of long-term objectives like 1.5 degrees uh, for uh, climate. We uh, have some uh, quantification up to 2070, but still use 2050 as a deadline. And of course, the, uh, this period over which we uh, model the trajectory serves to think of policies and measures on the short term. Uh, yeah, this is just a, a representation of the uh, modeling principle. I'm, I, I don't think I should uh, discuss it very much. It just shows that we start uh, on the right with the uses, with the services, and we get uh, backwards to uh, primary resources. Uh, maybe it's important to uh, signal that the model includes uh, poorly balance of the electric system, show, uh, checking the uh, security of uh, the system. And we have, as I said, mo models to uh, uh, take care about greenhouse gas emission, raw uh, material, air pollution, and economics in terms of cost and investments and uh, jobs. Um, another important uh, uh, concern and important framing of our work is that we are very uh, cautious about innovation. That doesn't mean, of course, that first that we, we don't like innovation, we like it. Uh, doesn't mean that we uh, think there won't be in, uh, any innovation uh, uh, making significant differences between now and 2050. But the point is that if you start counting of innovations that are not mature enough to succeed, then you take a huge risk. So we prefer to develop a strategy, develop a scenario that would work based on existing or mature enough options. Uh, that comes in two ways when, uh, in, in terms of cautiousness. First, I don't know if you, if you know those uh, standardized uh, uh, scales that are used uh, on an on, on, on international level about technological readiness level and Manufacturing readiness level (TRL and MRL). We just use we we use those scales um, to pick in our scenarios options that are at levels of seven or uh, over, which means they are already mature enough to be confident in their uh, industrial deployment over the next decades. Um, so when when they are already nine or ten we can start implementing in our scenario we can start implementing them uh, straight away when they are still at seven or eight level that means we can count on them by 2030 or 2035 so we take this into account but this is a first level of, con uh, of cautiousness the second level of cautiousness is taking into account not only the technical or manufacturing feasibility of those options, but taking also into account their environmental or social impacts. Uh, so we created this uh, environmental and social readiness level, which uh, uh, accounts for the level of understanding, characterization, assessment uh, of uh, these impacts to make sure that the options we uh, choose and we pick in the scenarios uh, can will not be detrimental. I now come to sufficiency, uh, efficiency and uh, renewable options. And I will uh, talk a little more about sufficiency, starting with saying that obviously sufficiency is uh, more difficult to handle in scenarios and more difficult to discuss than efficiency because efficiency is about technical performance. It's about um, uh, uh, 
uh, well, effectiveness of processes, uh, reducing losses, so you can quantify it. Uh, it's less easy to quantify uh, sufficiency. Still, first, you can find indicators, like, for instance, uh, heated square meters per person in households or uh, kilometers covered per person per year. So you, th there are sufficiency related indicators. And also you can use quanti at least uh, qualifying scales like this one to discuss among all the energy services we use, uh, their priority and their, uh, I mean, the, 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 yeah, the, their usefulness. I mean, it, it's obviously uh, more useful to cook your food than use a, an SUV in Paris. Uh, so you can discuss differences, you can discuss priorities, and uh, then discuss regulations uh, to uh, instituate or dissuade, and you can build assumptions on the evolution of sufficiency, the evolution of energy services in uh, scenarios. And it's increasingly important, and it's increasingly seen as a top priority. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, mention here uh, the fact that uh, for the first time in its latest uh, assessment report, the sixth assessment report, uh, which was published in, tw in 2021, the last one uh, dated back to uh, 2014, um, IPCC included a whole chapter on energy demand and included in uh, the uh, summary for policymakers of the uh, working group three report, this definition, it coined the definition of sufficiency. And uh, I mean, you, 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 you said, David, that we, uh, I mean, the, the work of Negawara has been uh, kind of influential and uh, one of the, uh, of this uh, uh, report uh, chapter on buildings starts with uh, like reminding that Negawad has been pioneer in developing the uh, sufficiency, efficiency, uh, renewable uh, approach. So yes, we had an impact, but we are very, uh, very happy with this definition, which reflects some of our uh, recent uh, uh, concerns. Um, so it says sufficiency policies are a set of measures that avoid demand for energy, materials, land, water. So you can see that it's not only about energy, of course, you can apply sufficiency to all resources. Um, but the, uh, the uh, second part of the definition is even more important. While delivering human well-being for all within planetary boundaries. And this uh, connects to uh, uh, a thinking developed, uh, especially through the uh, donut economy uh, theory. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, the idea is that the uh, fair uh, economic level and safe economic level for uh, humanity is somewhere beyond planetary boundaries and uh, decent living condition for everyone. And so sufficiency is uh, the way we see it and uh, that appeared also on the previous scale about some vital needs that need to be fulfilled. So sufficiency is not about reducing everything. Sufficiency is about increasing what is vital or useful while decreasing what is not. And that is a way actually to uh, uh, collectively uh, meet those uh, planetary boundaries, those limits, while redistrib redistributing access to resources and access to services. So there's a strong link between the suffi sufficiency as we define it and as we try to uh, work on it in our scenario and equity, solidarity, social justice uh, issues. And uh, I really want to uh, emphasize that. When it comes to what sufficiency can mean, uh, we distinguish between different levels or different stages of sufficiency, uh, starting with what we call servicial. Servicial means a more clever, uh, better use of existing equipments. 
existing buildings, uh, existing vehicles, and so on. So the it's about uh, better setting the intensity or duration of use of those uh, equipment, and that is the sufficiency that is often referred to when talking about behavior change, well, when talking about uh, changes of consumer habits, because this is something that for the most part of it uh, can be implemented on an individual level. But most of, suffic of sufficiency levels uh, actually come with much more uh, collective uh, practices, uh, starting with uh, the uh, dimensioning of our equipments and uh, <clears throat> I mean, it, it could still, to, to, to some extent, be individual when uh, it comes to uh, the size of your appliances, for instance. But uh, when we talk about the size of uh, vehicles, when we talk about the size of buildings, we see that there's uh, much more, uh, much more uh, collective issues uh, coming in. And furthermore, when we uh, discuss sufficiency that uh, can occur on a collective organizational level, uh, sharing some equipments, sharing some uh, part of uh, collective buildings, uh, sharing cars, uh, uh, developing co-working or teleworking practices and so on, or even further, um, reducing distances we need to cover through a better uh, account for these issues in urban planning then you can uh, imagine how this depends on policies, how this depends on business models much more than individual choices. So we uh, often uh, refer in our scenario to uh, uh, sufficiency supply policies in the sense that the businesses, uh, policymakers need to create the conditions for people to, to be more sufficient in their lifestyles and in their habits and not counting on people to change first. Uh, we uh, also, of course, uh, account in our uh, modeling, in our scenario for uh, uh, non-energy related sufficiency, like sufficiency on uh, uh, materials through uh, better, uh, better um, uh, design of, uh, um, sorry, uh, packaging uh, or sufficiency on uh, uh, food consumption, uh, especially due to the uh, impact of uh, meat on um, climate change and uh, other issues. Um, I'll go uh, much faster on um, efficiency stages. Uh, then, I mean, maybe the this first one is important. We uh, uh, identify a clear need for. Uh, uh, for uh, targeting gray energy, which means the energy that is used to build uh, buildings, to manufacture goods, to uh, manufacture vehicles. Uh, we, uh, for instance, uh, shift to uh, uh, more use of uh, biomaterials instead of uh, concrete and steel in buildings, uh, in new buildings. Um, then on the level of useful energy, the uh, main issue is the uh, performance of buildings. And the, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, a very uh, efficient thermal retrofitting of all buildings is an important part of the scenario. And it's something you can't really escape when you want to uh, get to uh, real uh, ambitious objectives in the long term. Um, <clears throat> final energy deals with the uh, performance of conversion. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, for instance, what is dealt with today with the uh, the uh, energy uh, labeling uh, system, and we can also have some uh, efficiency on the level of primary energy. Then about renewables, um, we uh, uh, have in our scenario, uh, as I said, uh, a shift to uh, flow-based ones. And what I want to emphasize with this uh, illustration is that um, this shift is not about the availability of, uh, uh, of uh, renewable resources. I mean, there's plenty of it, uh, thanks to uh, all the uh, light received uh, 
uh, on Earth surface every uh, every year. I mean, uh, one hour one hour of uh, of uh, uh, sun lighting is enough in in, in quantitative terms uh, to uh, feed all on our energy needs. But of course, the issue is not the availability; it's the it's the availability in uh, a form that is effective enough. So it's about using these like diffuse uh, energy flows uh, in a way that is as effective, as efficient as we, we, we can use stock historically, or not historically, uh, um, geologically uh, created stocks uh, of uh, fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> I will just uh, uh, go uh, fast through those uh, main orientations of the uh, of the scenario because uh, I already mentioned some some of them. But uh, uh, for buildings, sufficiency means dealing with floor areas, and uh, our scenario uh, is based on uh, an assumption of stabilizing floor areas per uh, per capita, uh, reducing new builds. Uh, and within buildings, uh, a reason, reasonable dimensioning of equipments and appliances. Uh, in terms of efficiency, I already mentioned the uh, issue of deep and complete, complete thermal retrofit of buildings. High performance of new buildings, of course, uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a crime to build a new building without, which is not uh, up to uh, the best possible performance, but uh, that is not very uh, not very um, significant. I mean, most of the uh, of the work that needs to be done on buildings uh, relates to existing ones and not new ones. Uh, and destroying more existing buildings to build new ones wouldn't be a good idea because of the gray energy that it would involve. Um, we uh, also uh, uh, work on um, substitution and. Uh, uh, in buildings, we think that we need to go for the most uh, efficient systems, wood uh, on for one hand, but mostly uh, heat pumps, uh, which become very relevant in uh, high uh, performance uh, buildings. For transports, we have some sufficiency options as well, model shift, reduction of 15% of kilometers per person per year mostly through a better urban planning, which reduces the distance, distances we need to cover to get broadly to uh, the uh, same services. A strong reduction of plane flight. That's because, I mean, due to our uh, principle on, in, on mature enough uh, technical options, I mean, there's no option to decarbonize uh, flight fast enough uh, in, uh, in our scenario, so we need to strongly reduce it. Um, reduction by 60% of, of the average consumption of cars, which become uh, mostly um, electric, uh, but we see some limitation in the shift to electric vehicles. And uh, especially we think that uh, priority should go to gas, green gas, can become ga green in, in the meantime, gas instead of electricity for for long distances and even more for uh, for uh, freight uh, electric freight means uh, i mean a, a nightmare in terms of material for the batteries or uh, electric uh, i mean um, electric cables to feed uh, trucks on motorways and if we go for that option, we think that uh, uh, reinforcing the uh, train system is uh, better. So we don't think we should go to uh, electric trucks, but still uh, there's uh, some discussion about it. But um, I, I told you uh, earlier that we uh, developed some concern for uh, uh, a fair access to uh, resources and uh, a, a, that translates into criteria of um, like limitations of the cumulative 
French consumption between now and 2050 of some critical raw materials. Uh, and we uh, developed this uh, accounting for uh, all metals and some of them are critical, mostly copper and lithium. And uh, in the case of lithium, you can hear, you can, you can see here, this red limitation, which uh, uh, is that the criteria we, we, we've been using, it uh, materializes the uh, French share of proven lithium reserves based on the uh, French share, the uh, share of French population in uh, worldwide population. So it's a kind of demographic share, demographic share of proven reserves, okay? And our criteria is we shouldn't go beyond this threshold. And you can see here that with uh, a recycling share that increases very much through time, even with this uh, uh, cycling sh uh, recycling share, uh, the uh, cumulative footprint uh, of lithium consumption in our scenario get quite close to that threshold, which means that if you take uh, less, uh, less uh, sufficient uh, assumptions like more cars or bigger cars or electrify electrifying trucks and so on, then you, you, you would clearly go over the threshold. It's only proven reserves, so uh, there are resources beyond, so we could go uh, beyond that threshold, but of course, going beyond it means first that you start saying, okay, we consider we uh, can have more access to the existing than other, which is obviously uh, not fair and not sustainable, or that we can have more access to it on the condition that there's more extraction, which is, of course, uh, not in line with the uh, sustainability uh, objectives as well. Um, in the industry, again, the same kind of uh, assumptions. Uh, sufficiency means less consumption of goods, uh, more circular economy, uh, and uh, some uh, re relocalization, relocation, sorry, of industry. Uh, but uh, that, I mean, um, uh, uh, selected relocation. I mean, uh, some scenarios foresee uh, like global relocation of most of our industry. We don't think that makes sense uh, in, a, in, in a global economy like ours, but uh, still uh, relocating some industry makes a lot of sense. We, uh, for instance, considered that uh, we can relocate up to 30% of uh, textile production uh, that comes with uh, more quality, that comes with more recycling capacity of these textiles. So there's uh, a, a virtuous uh, relocation uh, um, that can be uh, foreseen in some sectors. Um, the uh, efficiency, of course, means more uh, efficient, uh, more efficient processes, means also some uh, uh, substitution in processes like electrifying some uh, manufacturing processes um, and yeah we uh, take all this into account in our scenario coming to uh, supply energy supply we develop all uh, renewable energies but uh, all that all those that are mature enough uh, meaning a lot of wind power uh, terrace uh, land and offshore uh, wind power a lot of photovoltaics uh, some biogas, some uh, wood mass, a lot less of liquid biomass, uh, and uh, almost no uh, marine energy, which is uh, uh, sometimes discussed for this uh, mature enough, uh, because of this uh, not mature enough criteria. Um, <clears throat> Alongside the uh, development of renewables, there's a decrease, of course, of uh, fossil fuels. And uh, you, can, uh, you can see in that graph, and that is important when you think in uh, carbon budgets, which means both cumulative terms and dynamics of reduction, that 
uh, it's uh, very important that most of the reduction comes in the first decade of our scenario. Uh, and that reduction applies to uh, all, um, all, uh, <clears throat> all uh, uh, fossil fuels. And there's no uh, temporary increase all along the trajectory, which is, uh, of course, uh, another uh, very important uh, issue. Um, I'll skip this one. Um, when it, so we uh, reduce fossil fuel. We also uh, reduce and actually uh, uh, phase out uh, nuclear power, which is obviously uh, a very big issue in France. Uh, the current situation is, uh, on the contrary, a massive program of lifetime extension over 40 up to 50 years of operation and the uh, French president actually decided last year that we should aim for extending the lifetime up to 60 years we think that's not reasonable that is uh, a big risk to take uh, a, a big risk especially of uh, impossible um, uh, impossible uh, um, arbitration between uh, nuclear safety when reactors are aging and electric security when you depend so much on the uh, availability of uh, a big nuclear fleet. Uh, so our uh, scenario is based on the idea that there's no lifetime extension beyond 50 years and that uh, to uh, manage this, we need to start shutting down reactors as soon as possible so that the, uh, the, 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 the phasing out is as smooth as it could. Um, so we uh, developed a lot of thinking about how this uh, uh, phasing out should, could be uh, smooth enough and flexible enough. And that calls for some changes in the uh, uh, current regulation. Uh, and we uh, also took into account in our uh, reasoning on phasing out uh, the uh, the need to mitigate some impacts, uh, phasing out the whole fuel cycle because it's not only about reactors. There are uh, some uh, uh, enrichment, conversion, reprocessing plants that come with it. Uh, the uh, reduction of accumulated materials, nuclear materials and waste, and the uh, local social impacts. I mean, when you shut down reactors because they concentrate so much activity in territories where there's not much other uh, economic activity. It's very important to uh, take this impact into account and smooth this local impact as well. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, overall view of our scenario on electricity, and I'm already up to one hour, I think. So uh, uh, it's uh, an increase of electric demand due to the need for hydrogen, Although uh, the uh, overall electric services uh, slightly reduced, but what is important regarding the uh, discussion on the, on the uh, <clears throat> feasibility of getting to 100% uh, renewables for electricity is that although our scenario is in line with all scenarios with an increase of uh, the uh, share of electricity in uses, uh, it comes with this reduction with some demand side management and reduction of uh, electricity apart from uh, the new uh, need for uh, hydrogen and also a strong reduction of peak of peak demand which is key to uh, to uh, mitigate the uh, security risks involved in shifting to renewables we uh, thanks to uh, especially thermal retrofitting of buildings uh, and the uh, large share of electric heating, we reduce current peak, uh, the current level of peak uh, of uh, almost or more than 90 gigawatts to less than uh, 60. Uh, this allows for developing a 100% renewable uh, production. You can see here uh, some numbers about uh, the uh, share of uh, wind PV and hydro, and uh, I mean, we uh, have limited development, although ambitious on those options. For instance, uh, we uh, have uh, 18,000 wind towers uh, on uh, French land by 2050 to, to compare to 
almost 30,000 already existing in Germany in a, in a, in a smaller territory. Uh, and as I said, we checked the, uh, through uh, some modeling the whole balance of our scenario. And we also checked that uh, there's no point in the trajectory where we need more uh, thermal fossil fuel plants. So there's a continuous decrease of uh, electric related CO2 emissions. Um, this is the uh, overall balance of the scenario. So uh, you can see through sufficiency, efficiency and renewables, we get from uh, this situation where uh, renewables only account for a small share of uh, the uh, French uh, energy balance to 100% of local uh, renewable energy, thanks to a 50% decrease of final energy consumption, mostly, uh, well, in part, thanks to sufficiency, in part, thanks to uh, efficiency. Um, <clears throat> so we get to 100% renewables for primary energy. That's one of the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, or that our understanding of this goal of affordable and clean energy for everyone. Uh, we get to uh, responsible uh, consumption, more responsible consumption and production through the uh, reduction of the overall raw material footprint. Um, you can see some details here, but the uh, overall reduction altogether is about uh, 30%. Um, and of course, uh, we uh, meet a carbon neutrality objective not only in domestic emissions, but also in uh, footprint, uh, assuming that uh, other countries evolve roughly uh, the same way uh, that we do. Um, we uh, also, uh, as I said, uh, analyzed that uh, the scenario provides multiple uh, co-benefits, uh, less uh, pollution, more protection of uh, biodiversity, uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, healthier food, healthier practices. I mean, the model shift to a uh, bike, for instance, to bike or, uh, or, uh, or walk accounts for 10,000 uh, premature death avoided by 2050 compared to today, every year. Uh, strong reduction of energy poverty, better distribution of access to resources, uh, uh, a strong economic development that is rooted in every territory and accounts for 600,000 net jobs created by 2030-2040. Uh, 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 and the scenario also comes in our view with more cooperation, more uh, social justice, more partnership, and uh, some uh, more democratic implementation of transition. Um, I'm running out of time, so I can't talk about the uh, European scenario, but you, you will get the slide and maybe I could uh, talk about it in the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> We are discussing. <laughs> um, you want to put the song? Oh, you, you can, we can use your computer with Zoom or uh, can you explain it? Okay, so we can make the ah, yeah. Oui, oui, okay, so that so that we can still use the uh, okay. Mm -hmm. You just want to send me your presentation or the link or uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not the French one. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, uh, wait. Well, let me. Uh, 
Okay, if so yves dot m a r i g n a c yeah uh, j n a c yes no g n a c actually uh, at negawat uh, yeah dot org oui. <laughs> we'll <learn that. laughs> okay uh, so, du coup tu peux remettre ce que tu partages avec eux non parce que tu partages avec les ah oui je, je... Ah. Vos micros, c'est bon Oui, c'est bon. Le micro, euh, on sait. Pardon. <rire> oui, là, ça va Je, je peux mettre là, je pense Test, test. So, hello everyone. Uh, I would like to start by uh, congratulating from all of us to congratulate Monsieur Marignac for such an influential scenario, but also to thank you for um, the very thorough presentation. It will be very hard for us to mention something that was wasn't already covered. <laughs> <laughs> so today, Arif, Sophie, and me, we will be discussing the Negawatt scenario for energy transition from France also to the EU. And um, we will try to...
quelque chose. Non. Ah, d'accord. Il faut cliquer une première fois et après ça marche. Ok. Ça ne marche pas. Ah, ok, parfait. Ok. So we will cover the context challenges of uh, the approach, but also there has been a significant analysis of sectoral consumption, which covers buildings, transport, industry, agriculture, and food, but also the energy production. And we will end with outcomes and impacts. <laughs> so what this approach aims, uh, this scenario aims to do is to offer a pathway to significantly reduce all environmental impacts and technological risks linked to our energy system uh, based on the Negawatt approach that we will be discussing further later. But to understand the context of why such a scenario is needed or it emerged, it's important to understand the global but also the French context. There are, um, due to the consequences of previous energy choices, of the um, climate change, of the uh, challenges and risks of technological change and health needs right now after COVID-19, uh, there has been changes and it's becoming hard, harder for us to deal with such consequences. And especially in the French uh, context, we have commitments and um, milestones to hit. So we have the Paris Agreement. There's a promise to keep global warming well below two degrees uh, Celsius degrees. In France, 2015 energy bill, there are promises to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75% and half fine, uh, final energy consumption by 2050. Um, and also reduce the share of fossil and nuclear energy and increase the use of renewable resources, which will be covered later on how to do that, how much of it is a viable actually option. And one of the critics or, um, of this uh, scenario is whether it's very ambitious or not, whether it's um, a viable option or not, but um, according to the writers and the authors of the scenario, is that it's not a prediction of the future, but rather a possible pathway um, that we will go through step-by-step uh, step how it can be possible and what kind of hypothesis and um, assumptions it is based on to be able to actually sustain the promises. So the approach here is based on, as covered, sufficiency, efficiency, and renewable. So it consists in prioritizing essential needs in individual and collective energy uses through sufficiency, which means less, uh, less um, wasteful uses, uh, rethinking, clever rethinking of packaging and all of those individual, but also collective choices. Also reducing the amount of energy required to cover each need through um, energy effic efficiency, which means rethinking thinking appliances and how to use them in a better way due to technology. But it's important to mention technology that exists because this is not about radical changes, but also about possible um, incremental changes um, that this scenario focuses on. And finally, developing renewable energy. So we're focusing on um, energy flows rather than finite resources. Now, what this scenario focuses on are two things. It's the um, uh, sectoral consumption, which focuses on buildings, transport, we, which we will go through one by one, um, and then energy production. The first one is buildings. And in France, the building sector accounts for more than 40% of energy consumption, but also one third stems from heating of buildings that were built before 1975. Now, there are strong assumptions about sufficiency and efficiency and the kind of changes that need to happen and the key policy outputs from this scenario show that we need to be making the renovation of existing buildings progressively compulsory, starting from those that are most energy uh, intensive. And then improving the training of building sector workers in global and efficient renovation, and then implementing simplified funding schemes, allowing each household to finance renovation through um, the savings that they made through their sufficient uh, practices. And also developing urban planning policies that regroup buildings on already built areas rather than independent detached buildings and opt for uh, collective accommodation rather than detached houses. So here there are, it's not a trade-off, but rather than an important investment to think about. So, um, 
we find that the renovation, effective renovation will cost almost 50 billion uh, euros per year, but it will also um, help us save several billions per year on energy bills and also create more than 500,000 jo local jobs. So it's up to um, the decision makers to see if this retro, retro profit is actually worth it and it's a good investment or not because the losses of energy anyway will cost us those 50 billion. So the second sector that we're gonna talk about is transport. So in France, the transport sector has been largely increasing um, in terms of road traffic in the past decades, and currently it represents the main source of greenhouse gas emissions in France. Again, there are um, this builds on sufficient um, uses and practices of individuals, but also collective uh, awareness and uh, what we call su sufficiency or sobriety in, in the French context. Uh, so reduce the key um, policy impacts are, uh, or key policy points are reducing the maximum speed limits on roads for, uh, to 80 kilometers per hour outside urban areas and on highway 110 uh, kilometers per hour, dropping all plans for new roads and airports and moving to massive investments in urban public transport and rail networks. So this, um, needs um, a choice or a collective choice to move from um, car using cars to actually um, uh, bicycles and uh, but also that needs investments from the government to uh, to build these biking lanes and the biking parks um, to move uh, those investments from bigger um, major roads and airports to to more sustainable air transport options. Also introducing a vehicle mileage tax on road freight, expanding the gas powered vehicle sector through partnerships involving vehicle manufacturers, fuel suppliers, and vehicle fleet managers. The fourth uh, priority, a fifth prioritizing land planning that encourages alternatives to the use of private cars, revising fuel taxes and ending air transport subsidies. So this is based on a substitution or uh, reduction of oil consumption, uh, which according to in the negative scenario, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, increase the country energy um, independence, enhance individual purchase and power, reduce national trade deficit, but also improve air quality and health, which sounds great, but we will see if that's um, possible given the level of sobriety that is now, which we will ask you about later. And now we'll move to the next industry. Yeah, so uh, I'll move on to talk about industry. And uh, as Noor mentioned, these are very ambitious uh, goals, ambitious policies that will be implemented or want to be implemented by 2050. Uh, industry is the only sector which has reduced its energy consumption in France in recent years. But don't be fooled, this was mainly due to offshoring uh, and other factors. Um, what the scenario wants to produce sort of is a world where there's um, less uh, packaging, increased recycling rates, um, replacing non-recyclable materials or those non-renewable resources by materials of natural origins, um, improving the performance of industrial processes through the systematic use of best technologies available. And it plans to do this or it'll be, this will be done via policies such as increasing the lifespan of equipment, particularly through better design and extended warranty periods. Um, encouraging reuse by making glass and certain types of plastics returnable, uh, tracing the origins of materials and semi-finished products to increase consumer awareness, and finally incorporating embedded energy used in the manufacturing state of products as a uh, criterion in public lenders. Um, next will be the uh, agriculture and food uh, sector. So the agricultural sector consumes little energy, but it emits large amounts of greenhouse gases, particularly the livestock farming uh, part of it. So what the scenario envisions is a change in eating habits with a reduced consumption of animal proteins and higher share of vegetable proteins, um, and also a change in agricultural practices, leaving old conventional farming uh, methods to more organic farming um, and integrated production. So the report itself goes into, or references another report that goes into more details on how this could be done. So a systematic approach for the use of land and biomass with the aim of establishing a new balance between food for human or animal consumption, production of energy and materials and conservation of ecosystems, biodiversity and soils. And then next we move on to the renewable energy uh, uh, sector. So 
or the energy sector focusing on renewable energy. So the, the scenario again wants to, or envisions a 100% renewable energies to cover all of our energy needs. But this will be also be tagged along with a reduction in our energy consumption. So a focus on renewables via policies by simplifying, clarifying, and establishing the legal and economic frameworks for all types of renewable energy, reforming the grid operator legal practices so that they can ensure that all renewable energy producers and consumers are treated fairly, um, giving renewable energy a status of public interest, and encouraging local groups and citizens to contribute financially to new renewable energy production methods. And you can see from the, uh, from the figure here uh, in blue what what the levels are in 2015 and what they want to be or aim to be at by 2050. So you can see solid biomass will almost double by uh, 2050. Biogas, which is virtually very little, will go up to 140, 135 uh, terawatt hours. Wind is going to be one of the highest providers of energy and solar will also play a bigger role. Um, as, you, as mentioned before, um, uh, land turbines or onshore turbines will be 18,000. This is almost three times the current number of wind turbines. Uh, offshore wind turbines will also be up to 3,000 and largely a huge increase in solar uh, PV uh, cells. Uh, finally, for my part, uh, fossil and nuclear energy. So again, the development of renewable energies combined with the reduction in energy demand will allow for nuclear energy production to be phased out by 2035 and, by, and for fossil fuels to be phased out by 2050. So along with this uh, closure of all these nuclear power plants, uh, it has to be accompanied by certain uh, factors that need to be taken into account. So firstly, closing each existing nuclear reactors 40 years at the latest after commissioning, uh, setting up career transition plans for the nuclear sector workers, and uh, fully reorienting energy taxation to stop supporting fossil and nuclear energy and encourage the development of renewable energies instead. And again, the rate of these these shutdowns should take into account three uh, specific issues, namely the energy issue, so the objectives to avoid any fallback on coal-fired plants or cause power cuts. Uh, second is safety issues, so the absolute priority must be nuclear safety, as the aging of nuclear reactors is currently a matter of growing concern. And finally, other industrial, economic, and social issues related to the nuclear sector. Um, next, I'll pass it on to Sophie, who will talk more about the branch energy. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation and Happy New Year for all of you, too. <laughs> um, so I will present the last part of um, the report, which talk about the French energy mix by 2050 and the social and environmental impacts in the local and national level. As Arif just said, the aim is to lower consumption significantly, significantly and to reach a 100% renewable energy scenario. And okay, here I have one question, then, then I will build on it. But um, the, re the report also proposed to shut down nuclear reactor by 20, uh, 2035 and by 2050 um, make disappear from the energy mix oil, fossil gas, and coal. <laughs> So this is how the French energy mix will look by 2050, according to the report. So this is under the Negavat scenario. So this is um, cut by sufficiency, this by efficiency, this is normal business as usual. And what we can see is the disappearance of nuclear, which is the purple one, uh, oil, which is the red, fossil gas, and we can see an increase on renewable electric energy, uh, bioenergy bio and other renewables. Um, and of course, um, the goals of sufficiency, efficiency, and a, a transition to renewables um, represent uh, a major um, goal when it comes to carbon neutrality, methane emissions, and greenhouse emissions. So, so to introduce you to my question or a little bit, uh, nowadays, the prospect of the lifetime of a uh, French reactor is about 40 to 50 years. I've, I've been reading that they are trying to expand the, life, the lifetime to 50, even 60 in USA. And here it was uh, uh, only 10 years. And nowadays, the, the average age of the Electricité de France, fleet of 
reactors is about 37 years. Most of them are from early 80s and 90s, I think. And of course, we can agree that nuclear has no future. It's, it's not the future of energy in France, uh, mainly because of the what what the waste represent, the uranium waste, the um, abandon of mining sites, and the fact that the cost effectiveness of new plants um, is more is less and less evident. But at the same time, there are many climate tipping points that we cannot trigger, and this is related to the previous slide that. Um, for the, for shutting down nuclear reactors is uh, the the scenario sets 2035, but for oil and coal is 2050. So then I will formulate the question. But I think that to find the most cost-effective combination, that is uh, actually this is uh, stated by Sepulveda in an article. It is important to contrast the cost of decommissioning nuclear reactors some of them earlier than expected. For example, um, there was one that I was inaugurated back in December, I think the Fl Flanambil second, and versus the cost, uh, the cost of producing electricity with reactors that are already set up, that have been working for decades, and which operative costs are really low. And to build on this, even more if we're considering a transition through towards wind and solar energy would tend to be a more volatile or intermittent so source of energies uh, versus a more firm uh, source of energies as, as nuclear. So uh, yeah, mainly because um, uh, working with volatile kind of uh, source energy implies to work on infrastructure to transport, produce, and store to compensate the intermittence or the, produc the production ga uh, gaps of wind and solar energy. Um, yeah, so low carbon resources might be an, an option, but one of my questions that then um, we will see is, can nuclear compensate this gap? Or even more taking into account another article that uh, we read about how cheap can renewables become? Like up to 75% of the energy uh, grid is okay, but more, more than that, they become more and more expensive. So when it comes to the social, economic, and environmental benefits, uh, we have that according to the ne Negavad scenario, uh, we will have better air quality, uh, thanks to the reduction in fine particles that take a huge toll on, on lives per year. Uh, a huge reduction in energy poverty, mainly this uh, is mainly based on the fact of infrastructure. Um, how do you say, uh, to improvements in the infrastructure sector. Uh, the savings uh, in the energy sector, mainly um, by saving money from imports on uranium, for example, and um, what it can represent for job creation. Um, this is mainly due to the increase in the renewable sector. Um, so this is the, the, the job post that we will see. But on the other side, we will experience, France will experience some uh, lost job in the car manufacturing sector, for example. When it comes to the local versus the global benefits, we find that in the local, uh, in, the, in the local level, um, a lot of the benefits experienced in the national level, for example, in, in savings, will be uh, transposed to the local level, uh, encouraging a greater, greater independence of the regions and more cooperation between urban and rural areas where uh, the balance of resources tend to be not that balanced, but um, more imbalanced. And on the global level, um, we know that nowadays access to energy is not equal for for the world for the whole world uh control over fossil resources it's a source of inequality too and we we experience growing disparities in, in terms of energy consumption so breaking with the habit of preying on the poorest poorest countries resources might be an option and for this the energy transition that is proposed on in the negative scenario is essential but again uh some of the of, of um not critiques but the the questions that 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 came to us is, as we know, energy energy sources have shaped um, modern politics along history. We have read a book uh, last year with the whole Roman 
uh, cohort, um, Car Carbon Democracy by Mitchell, and how power is where the control or the reserve of energy resources is. Not only power, but also conflict. And power here understood as in a Bavarian kind of, uh, not power as electricity, but power as domination. And so as alternatives, energy sources enter the picture and we push away carbon, um, how you think that this can shape future power relationships between countries and how do you imagine the geopolitics of the renewables? And even more, if we take into account the higher material intensity that, that is supposing alternative energy sources or renewables, um, which, which imply using, extra extracting and transporting materials, which supply is vulnerable because you can only find it in a small number of countries, which, are, which is uh, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Chile, and Peru. Not only that, but most of the minerals are on native um, populations land, vulnerating property rights and posing a conflict regarding property rights. And also according uh, to some of the literature we have read, the extraction, the extraction of minerals for the transition will need to increase by five, by 2050. Of course then, uh, during your presentation, I was thinking about the peak demands that you mentioned in that case that will, of course, uh, decrease the, the impact of, of this. Okay, these are some graphs about uh, how that, that express this high material intensity that, that, that is uh, embodied in the, in the renewables transition, but we can leave that for later, uh, which are the, the, um, the minerals that we're talking about. We're talking about nickel, copper, cobalt, lithium, uh, yeah, then I can send you the, the PowerPoint if you want. Uh, and when it comes to the local impacts, um, it is clear that there's a dichotomy between the goals that are needed and the ones that we, we can practically, uh, we can achieve practically. And I'm not going to question whether it's feasible or not, the Neavat scenario, but in my mind, which is really hard to imagine is how France can carry on with this or reach agreement, mainly because we're talking about a myriad of actors, for example, CEOs, institutions, academics, how, how are we thinking that all, all of them are going to agree on this? In the size, uh, in, on the side of the industry, France could uh, face a position uh, on one side uh, from EDF, which is a very vertical and centralized institution. We have the risk of lobby and, and yeah, the risk of lobby, and also in the manu in the car manufacturing um, industry, for example, how sure we are there's willingness to change the manufacturing logic, how feasible it is. So it seems like more effective transfer of power and resources with clear responsibility, definition, commitment, and resource allocation is needed. And on the public side, while it's true that in the last years, efficiency and efficiency and also has not been properly encouraged, or and there has been an underinvestment in the electric sector. Uh, what you mentioned about the um, thermal red, I don't, I don't remember, retrofitting. Uh, so given this, what is expected? Like the, the higher price of electricity in the green transition will trickle down to vulnerable uh, populations. And again, the dichotomy, who's going to pay for it, taxpayer or firms? So yeah. Oh yeah, and it seems to be a, a bicycle between preventing rising in the price of electricity and the lobby positions on the other side. So thank you and the questions. I think we already started with the questions implicitly, uh, but um, our questions are mainly structured as the scenario itself. So um, some questions are about the assumptions themselves as a starting point, the energy mix and then global and local impacts. So I will start with um, the very first question. Um, and this is something that you have already um, um, touched upon in, in, in your discussion, is that the scenario is based on strong assumptions betting on the French uh, sobriété. Uh, it's like the, the sufficiency and the level of awareness to make these uh, sufficient uses um, of resources with no clear step strategy of how to boost or establish this sobriety. And is the level of national sobriety enough to sustain the scenario's objectives that are mentioned? And is a monitoring plan put in place to track and maintain it? But I, what you have already 
um, talked about is that it's not just a burden upon the individual um, behavior, but it's also um, encouraged by businesses and the ecosystem itself to facilitate these conscious decisions. So we, we are aware of that answer that you have already mentioned uh, in your discussion, but I think it's still a valid question to, um, or it's, it's still a strong assumption to have this level of sobriety as a starting point. So we'd like to know uh, what you think about that. And I'll move the word to you, Uh Yeah, my, my question was the assumptions that uh, renewables will cover 100% of the uh, energy demands uh, was very bold. But I mean, if we want to make a big change, we have to make uh, bold decisions. Um, I was wondering, what about the intermittency issues regarding renewables? And then to follow up the same uh, the questions along the same lines is that in the report, it's mentioned that power to gas will be a stability measure, uh, but batteries were not included. And I'm assuming that also plays a role in what Sophia was mentioning with all the uh, minerals involved. So maybe you could touch up on that too. I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. But um, so the first one regarding energy mix is why the, the shutdown of nuclear reactor is announced first rather than prioritizing the end of coal. And is it not this irrational and contrary to the to the efficiency goal? And would it make sense to um, retain the benefits of the surplus nuclear energy that is already working, um, even taking into account the compensations that we have to give to the um, EDF in the case of decommissioning nuclear reactors? And when it comes to global and local impacts on the global side, given the um, the fragile state of energy and dependence of Europe on, Rus on Russia, oil and gas. Has the Russia and Ukraine crisis changed the role of nuclear in the negative scenario? What about the ge geopolitical reshaping of the world based on renewables? And last but not least, if in a national level, it's a plan that is bound to fail, not because it's ambitious, but because of this uh, vice circle um, inside of the, of, of the country. And at, at the end of uh, who has the last word? Is it taxpayer? Is it firm CEOs, the state? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Particularly thankful for the fact that you mentioned uh, uh, the, the consecration of the policy renewables, uh, which tells you how it's difficult to frame a whole presentation of the scenario in uh, one hour. But <laughs> um, so, yeah, starting with the uh, assumptions on the uh, on, on energy demand and assumptions on the level of sufficiency, uh, I mean. We, we are convinced uh, through some return of experience in other countries, through our work, through uh, first that, I mean, building, projecting, and implementing sufficiency assumptions makes it, it works the same way as efficiency assumptions or supply related assumptions. I mean, there's no there's no intrinsic difference. It's all about finding the right indicators, finding the right levels, and implementing the right uh, policies and measures. Uh, the reason why there's less confidence in it is that it's been much less implemented, much less explored, much less documented. But the more we document the, uh, the, the, the feasibility of such policies, I mean, the more experience we have, the more we are convinced that it is possible. And one example is the way the uh, mobility in Paris changed over, over a few years, thanks to change, changes in policy makings regarding the, uh, the uh, cycling infrastructures, for instance. So some such changes are possible, and we, we, we are really convinced. That's the first point. Uh, we, we, think that the level of sufficiency we uh, foresee or we represent in our scenario is really not radical. 
uh, for instance, we uh, stabilize uh, square meters per person. I mean, when we uh, discuss about it with our partners in building an, a European scenario, we have to talk about people in Romania or Bulgaria, which have 30% less. So uh, <clears throat> we, uh, so we, we are very confident about it. And the uh, current shift in policy making and in uh, discussion uh, where, where sufficiency uh, in a few months became very fashionable uh, in, in the French debate is even, uh, even more uh, feeding our uh, confidence. Uh, the uh, other kind of technical level where you question the feasibility of the scenario is the feasibility of 100% renewables. Uh, especially in the uh, electric sector. I mean, I, I won't go into a, a detailed discussion about it, but uh, uh, clearly, uh, first, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the uh, incredible gains in performance of renewables, like a, a tenfold improvement for photovoltaics, a threefold improvement for wind power in 10 years, makes it much more possible than it than we could even think about 10 years ago uh including in in, in terms of competitiveness including in terms of overall materials uh land use footprint um and obviously we need i mean to get to 100 percent renewables we need some strong changes um, and we need to think about the electric system in a different way we need to move away from uh, from a dispatchable centralized thermal power plants. And, and but all the technical bricks we need from um, uh, from um, um, flexibility of demand to interconnections to uh, short and long time storage. Uh, are there and yes of course we have batteries in the scenario and batteries will be needed to uh, balance uh, electricity uh, for instance between peak photovoltaics generation by midday and the uh, electric needs of uh, the evening but batteries won't do the work over long uh, the interseasonal storage and that's where we need power to gas uh, but all these bricks, as well as those that are needed, it's called grid forming, to substitute the uh, current uh, role of inertia of big turbines and so on, to stabilize the grid. I mean, all those technological bricks are mature enough, again, to be confident on the feasibility. And regarding the costs, I mean, first, when you, when you, uh, I mean, uh, if you stick to renewables plus nuclear power systems, well, first, if you say we can't get to 100% renewables, I mean, that such a system doesn't is not possible, then you have a big problem because there are many countries where you need to reach 100% decarbonization without nuclear because you can't, either because people don't want it or because you can't technically or uh, or uh, given the uh, institutional uh, situation you can't develop i mean what what if sarkozy had was successful in selling re reactors to libya for instance 10 years ago yeah so if you say 100% renewables is not possible then you consider that uh, some countries won't succeed and they will need to keep thermal fossil plants so we miss the uh, paris agreement so paris agreement needs 100 percent electric renewable systems to be possible and if that's possible then it becomes relevant everywhere because the uh, difference of cost between renewables and nuclear power a new nuclear power is so big that it covers the extra cost of storage of flexibility that you need for 100% renewable systems. Um, the, uh, I mean, your, your, your question about 
how fast we phase out nuclear reactors. In, it, it's a very complex balance. Um, I mean, the point is if you consider that it's safe to keep them as long as possible, then you expose yourself to the risk of their failure, either for safety or technical reasons or for economic reasons. So you can't, I mean, it, it's very risky to bet on depending on aging reactors for a long time. So our point is we should start phasing out as soon as possible. So we, which is the key to make the phasing out as smooth as possible. I mean, the, the uh, earlier you start, the uh, easier it will be to make it last longer and the less risky it will be. So that, and yeah, the, uh, that, that's really, uh, and, and you say rather than prioritizing the end of coal, I mean, there, there's no coal for electricity in, the, uh, in our French scenario. Um, we think that, I mean, it's key to avoid situations where you would need temporarily a lot more fossil fuels. And again, phasing out as early and as smoothly as possible is the best way to do that. If you, if you defer this, uh, this uh, phasing out, then you expose yourself like we experienced this winter in France to, to this risk. Uh, I mean, your, your, uh, I mean, your, your points are, uh, I mean, clearly uh, very uh, relevant on the, uh, yeah, on, on geopolitics, on business issues. Um, I mean, the, uh, the obstacles to a fair, smooth, uh realistic transition as we try to uh, represent in our scenarios are first uh convincing everyone so that a democratic obstacle but i don't think it is actually an obstacle i mean the uh, citizen convention for climate for instance show that people when they when you get them to really think about it get convinced that this is the right way forward the second obstacle by, by range of, uh, of difficulty is businesses. I mean, I don't believe in an energy transition that would not uh, rely mostly on economic incumbents. Uh, I mean, we, we, we can't wait to uh, uh, replace them by uh, other much more uh, virtuous uh, big companies. So we need to get economic incumbents to the kind of radical shift that is needed. And the, I mean, the way, um, what, what you pointed about uh, monopolies and, uh, and, and dominant situations is clearly a strong obstacle. Democracy is the way to overcome it. Um, and finally, geopolitics. And you're right. I mean, energy transition will mean strong changes in existing interdependencies. And that is very hard to tackle. Um, I, I don't agree with the uh, idea of strong new dependencies coming from renewables. Uh, coming from energy transition, like for lithium, for electric vehicles, yes. Coming from renewables, no. I mean, the, uh, the global share of renewables in the, uh, in the uh, raw materials consumption is small. So the issue is more about digital, is more about electric vehicles than renewables. But again, you have geopolitical incumbents and it's hard to, uh, to, to tackle. Uh, whether the uh, Russia-Ukrainian crisis uh, changes the way we see it, not at all. On the contrary, it reinforces our uh, vision that we should aim for 100% renewable-based uh, systems where there's no more strong dependencies on uh, energy resources. Yeah. Questions based on curiosity of, about the work of uh, Negawatts in also in the lobbying uh, as a think tank. 
So first, in the in the framed scenario, um, I was wondering if there is a strong lobby uh, for nuclear energy, and if there is consensus among the sustainable energy think tanks um, of the position of nuclear energy that you presented here, and how is this uh, negotiations? And on the international level, EU, but also more globally, uh, at the COP27, we saw that the biggest debate was about the loss and damage fund and uh, transfer of funds from developed countries to developing countries. And I would like to know what's the position of Negawatts about this, if you are pushing forward for um, more money from developed countries, from the EU countries, to this loss and damage funds. Okay, thank you. Uh... So on your uh, on your first point, I mean, <clears throat> there is there is a, a strong pro nuclear lobby in France, and it's uh, I mean, we we are faced with a kind of paradox nowadays that I mean the uh, French nuclear industry has never faced so many uh, troubles in and, and so deep troubles, uh, and that instead of you know making the uh, the uh, of allowing for the uh, global debate to uh, kind of shift away from this kind of nuclear lock in it kind of revives the uh, nuclear myth of you know energy security energy competitiveness and so on and so forth so it's uh, it's it's a very hard uh, situation i would say many uh, many um, experts in like sustainability oriented uh, energy related think tanks share the view that well first nuclear is not the uh, it, it is not the solution second that new nuclear is might not be needed um, but uh, Negawatt is one of the uh, uh, only ones to really uh, stand with a clear vision of a 100% uh, renewable system. On your second question, uh, I mean, we, we don't get into, uh, into uh, international um, uh, negotiations uh, and, and we, there's no negawatt position on the, such an issue. We uh, nevertheless are, as I mentioned, uh, very much concerned with international fairness uh, issues. So uh, we uh, are very much aware of and concerned with developed countries' responsibility in uh, creating this uh, unsustainability and the fact that uh, uh, poorer countries suffer more than us uh, from uh, this impact. So we are in favor of such processes as uh, loss and damage uh, uh, covering, but uh, I mean, we are more focused on uh, envisioning a future where the sharing of access to resources would be more uh, would, would be fairer, um, and yeah, where uh, historical responsibility would be taken into account. I mean, for instance, I uh, mentioned our criteria criteria of you know the friend. A kind of demographic share of proven reserves of uh, of uh, raw materials. Uh, we are currently discussing whether we should reinforce such uh, criteria um, to uh, take into account historical responsibility and the fact that the uh, I mean developed economies have most of the uh, existing stock of already extracted. Uh, metals, for instance. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and to my colleagues. Um, I'm going to go straight to the point. I would like to know what is the kind of governance that you propose in order to achieve these uh, technical solutions, let's say. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I don't have any uh, silver bullet uh, answer to that. Um, I mean, altogether, uh, more uh, more democratic governance is key, and more horizontal governance is uh, is key. So uh, maybe uh, I, I could first mention that um, we we think um, I mean the more we 
we can only get to the level of implementation that is needed through a much deeper understanding by everyone, uh, every person, every stakeholder, every uh, economic uh, player of the need to collectively change. Uh, it, it's key for uh, individual interests uh, to be overcome by our collective interests, which is another obstacle today. So uh, this can only come through more deliber deliberative processes. And even on the citizen level, as I said, the uh, Citizen Convention for Climate in France showed that this is uh, possible. Um, maybe a second comment I could make is about the uh, the uh, commons or common goods. Uh, we uh, uh, really think that th there's a way forward in thinking about energy transition as a, a, a governance through commons for the preservation of commons. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I have a question linked to the governance. I wanted to ask whether you developed uh, uh, not only the scenario, but also like the policies that would lead to it. And uh, I guess there is more uh, of a political decision making also whether to go like by micro instruments or how to like, um, uh, yeah, set the policies that would lead to this change. Mm -hmm. And the second one is a practical one. And I wondered what are you doing in order to uh, push the implementation of the scenario? Uh, because I guess, uh, or like from the experience from the Czech Republic, it's not enough to have the scenario uh, for 2050. And uh, um, uh, that links to the legitimacy of it. And uh, how are, where are you getting the legitimacy to come with the, the scenario and uh, make the policymakers or anyone to listen to you? Okay, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, your first question is, yeah, I mean, how to, um, I mean, you, you said governance or yeah, we, if, if we develop proposals for policies and measures, yes, uh, yes, we do, um, and uh, I, didn't talk about it, but there's a whole chapter in our latest scenario about these uh, proposals. Um, we we have focused on the, rather on short term proposals, um, like uh, the uh, changes that should be implemented in the uh, in in the next mandate. Um, but some of them are uh, more uh, overarching or framing. Like um, we we think, for instance, that. We need to get to a, a kind of a compulsory system for thermal retrofitting of buildings. Um, we, I mean, I personally uh, had the ambition uh, when we started working on our latest scenario that we could work on a, a kind of policies and measures pathway. Like, you know, I, I just mentioned commons that we could like think of a kind of much more like utopian or idealistic policy framework for the long term. Like think of what is the uh, institutional system in 2050 that has made this change possible. And then like, you know, uh, retroactively think in terms of progressive implementations of policies and measures that get us there because that, that, like, yeah, I, I have the intuition we need that. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, it's very difficult to build. We did not have the resources to really build it. Therefore we focused on short term, but we, we need to make that connection. Um, when it comes to legitimacy and uh, influence in, uh, in policy making, I mean, as, as David said in the beginning, we, uh, I mean, we've, we've been, uh, advocating on those scenarios for 20 years. We've been showing, um, uh, well, uh, um, I mean, technical credibility, and we, you know, we've been serious 
with our work. Uh, and uh, I mean, that, that's the only legitimacy we have. And, uh, but yeah, we are, we are uh, I mean, our work is acknowledged to be one of the uh, main sources for thinking about these changes in France. So we are just part of the discussion and we, we can only keep it that way. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I have a bit of very specific question. Um, first, uh, you talk about the chain of uh, energy losses between primary and uh, energy services. Uh, we'd like to know if you have any idea of uh, like the yield, energy, energetic yield for uh, if, you, if we compare a thermal car and an electrical car, like from the very beginning, the source, and because I don't find it in, on the internet. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know if you have any um, capture, uh, storage carbon uh, technology in your scenario, and if not, why? And lastly, yeah, I wanted to know uh, uh, about the biogas um, as a stabili uh, stabilizer for, for um, the issue of volatility. And I wanted to know, there's no um, pollution issue with like when we burn gas generally or like... Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, first question was about, yeah, electric vehicle. I mean, I, I, I will only say two things. Electric vehicles are much more efficient than thermal ones in terms of ratio between final energy and, uh, and, uh, and energy uh, for uh, motricity. Uh, but the gray energy is very much depending on the size of vehicles. So, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's really key. And the, the, one of your comments was about uh, car, car manufacturers and, and car manufacturers need to change their business model. I mean, it's based on selling less, but big, uh, very, uh, very, uh, uh, technological uh, and, uh, and expensive vehicles that won't work with uh, electric vehicles. So we, we we really need to get to smaller ones, like Chinese are developing, uh, for instance. Um, your second question was on, yeah, carbon storage. We, I mean, we we have natural. We have a, a thanks to the work by After, we have a reinforcement of natural uh, carbon sinks. Um, which at least works by 2050. There's a big question on how this lasts over the second half of the century. We don't have by 2050 any uh, technological uh, carbon sinks, and we think it's important to avoid putting them into uh, into uh, the vision because that would uh, that would uh, uh, reduce the incentive to. Uh, Develop the kind of options we uh, we see, and uh, regarding biogas and the uh, the, uh, the, the 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 carbon uh, uh, balance, uh, yeah. Well, I mean <clears throat> that there's first an issue with the carbon balance, so that depends on uh, how you run the cycle and so on, and then yes, uh, burning uh, burning biogas. Uh, is uh, still polluting and it's still uh, a source of uh, pollution. Uh, nevertheless, if you, uh, if you, I mean, in our scenario, we, uh, I mean, gas is mostly used in uh, vehicles and industry. Industry, you can, uh, you can filter and you can, uh, uh, and, and, and you can avoid this local pollution to uh, affect uh, populations. Uh, in transports, uh, the uh, uh, benefit from reducing the size and number of cars, and therefore the uh, air pollution by uh, uh, erosion of uh, of tires or uh, or uh, road, uh, is bigger than the fact of keeping some uh, pollution due to uh, biofuels or uh, biogas. Sorry. Okay, um, mine is more of like a, a, a marketing kind of a question because I mean, so I, I really enjoyed um, seeing or learning about what you're doing and it, I feel that it would create an impact. So it's a matter of of sort of promoting it. So I'm wondering if uh, what your thoughts are on maybe partnering with a different industry like 
award people, you know, that they, you know, they have design awards in every industry that kind of make it, um, uh, make it prestigious, but mm -hmm. they don't do it from, um, from this kind of perspective. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are in partnering. Cause like, for example, in architecture, they also have certification um, organizations like LEED or Living Building Challenge or things like that. So are there efforts right now to partner with or are there thoughts about partnering with these institutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Last question, maybe a, a reform to claim a nuclear plant for Libya, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I had two questions. <laughs> uh, very short, though, very short. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think this is the fourth scenario or the third scenario. That, uh, fifth, the I fifth. Think, uh, yeah. Uh, have you seen, like, throughout the different scenarios, are, are they becoming more and more possible and reachable compared to the previous ones, or do you see it slowly slipping away? And the second question is... Uh, does the name of the association mean anything? Like the scenario? Okay. Uh, yeah, just curious. <laughs> so just the, the, the very last one is easy to answer. Negawatt means, uh, stands for the energy that you avoid to use. That's uh, very simple. And it comes from a typo in, uh, in, uh, in an American uh, expert, uh, energy expert manuscript, one of the uh, father of... Uh, uh, energy demand thinking called Amory Lovins um, in the uh, 70s. Um, your uh, your question about like partnerships, awards, and uh, I mean how we could like uh, make um, like design or innovation, uh, design thinking in in the direction of the scenario more visible or more uh, attractive. I mean it, it's a good one. But we 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 haven't uh, developed that. Haven't very much explored it. Uh, but I know there are some uh, people thinking about like some uh, sufficiency related awards, uh, international awards. So that that could be a way forward. Um, but no, that really not much for the time being. Uh, and regarding the, uh, I mean the the, the question about how the scenarios evolved and whether they are more uh, plausible or I mean, it's it's difficult to say i mean it's a combination of increased ambition through time uh, because the uh, i mean the the objectives are raised i mean we didn't talk about carbon neutrality for instance in our first scenarios i mean we this was at a time when we thought that, uh, you know, reducing by 75% uh, emissions would be enough, not reaching uh, carbon neutrality, for instance. There were much more concerns for raw materials, biodiversity, and so on. Um, and they're also more challenging because we have less time, as I, as I explained. But... And, and they remain very challenging because from one scenario to the next, our first, uh, our first point is the five last years haven't put us on the right pathway, okay? Uh, nevertheless, there is progress. I mean, the uh, increased performance of renewables, the fact that sufficiency, that more and more people understand the need for sufficiency, for instance, makes it more possible to project more ambitious changes over less time. So it's really a, a, a kind of balance between them, but we, we kind of, when one, each time we publish a scenario, we kind of think, okay, this is the last time we can make it. If it doesn't start to happen now, we can't make the next one and pretend it's realistic, but still from one exercise to the next we can. <laughs> So welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>